So the five biggest mistakes that I made in business this year. I think this is really important. When I speak to different people, one of the big criticisms for a lot of stuff online is actually to do with people only ever show the good stuff, the magical, I made a million pounds, I bought a Lamborghini, this all went brilliant, look how good I am. But the truth is for most people, 99% of people, they don't live like that. And I know people are starting to get turned off from social media because actually they don't trust and they don't believe that content. And it's most of it's bullshit anyway, so I kind of get that. So I wanted to kind of flip it on its head and almost share the thinking on some of the stuff that I've been doing, just to kind of be honest about my journey and some of the stuff that we've done. Um, and actually just go through some different topics that you might find interesting, you might not, but you know, maybe. And um, the first biggest mistake that I actually made this year, but to be honest, this past three years. So in, I started to work for myself in 2019 as a management consultant. So people hire me to do stuff. So basically uh, companies like Maureen uh, will very kindly hire me and I go in to either help run their company or do their marketing or support a particular project, but people hire me to go in and do stuff. I'm basically a management consultant, so like a freelancer, but to do management level stuff. That's what people kind of hire me to do. As we all know, uh, in 2020, right at the start, COVID hit. So basically people stopped seeing anyone because of uh, COVID and we were locked in our houses, that kind of thing. So what I started to do at that point was start to learn how to live stream and almost build an online business. So I do podcasts and live streams and that kind of thing. But as the world started to open up again in 2021, 2022, the mistake that I made, which I now kind of realize is that I kind of stayed online. So in theory on LinkedIn, I have 20,000 followers. But one of the problems that I realized is actually I didn't have a core base to build from. And when I would look at the network and look at other people that do stuff, most people have a core solid base within their existing network or their existing city who support them, champion them, and you feel part of that group and they identify you as part of that group. And I realized about three, four months ago that I'd been trying to aim up here to do all this great YouTube stuff and I started to get paid off YouTube but I didn't have a core local base that yes, I have a city and yes, I know lots of people, but I don't think any group identified me as part of their group and vice versa that I think was kind of true. But what that did, I think it's really hurt me in some ways because often as a, an entrepreneur, you need support and you need people to pat you on the back and to ask, bounce stuff off. But also when you put social posts up, people that support you and you support them and that kind of thing. And I kind of miss that and some of it was conscious because I thought, well, if you want to grow the biggest business and scale as much as you can, you go for this online thing and hit people. Like with the roadmap, we have users in 55 countries, but I missed the core base of the business. Um, so one of the things that I've really tried to rectify, I've joined a local tech community called Dynamo. And then what I'm planning to do is basically go to more in-person events here in the Newcastle and the Northeast kind of area just to kind of reestablish connections and get to know people again. And the point is, or the learning is that no matter where you are in the world, yes, it's great to do stuff online, but actually never miss the importance of uh, basically building real life in human connections. And I think it's really important. I got it wrong. I've now kind of rectified that. And yes, don't get me wrong, I'm still gonna be doing more, if anything, of the online stuff, but it's really important to have that core base of support and network and stuff as well. Okay. Number two, um, I identified that I was making the wrong content. So the, my approach for a long time was to talk about stuff that I thought was interesting or that was going on in the world. And at the moment we've got inflation, we've got cost of living, we've got all this kind of different stuff. And what I would do is that I would do a live stream. It might be half an hour and I would clip that up into lots of different five minute clips and I would put them onto YouTube. But the issue was, it wasn't specific for what people actually search for, if that makes sense. So I might talk about some, or Tony who presents on the channel did a really great, it was a brilliant topic to do with uh, business lessons from the Roman Empire. And it was, it was fascinating, it was really good. It was based on a film and a series that he'd watched and some books and it was a brilliant piece of content. But the issue is on YouTube, unless people search for that, they don't find it. So not only did we put a lot more focus into our YouTube SEO to our job titles, but the truth is I was just creating the wrong stuff that there's also something called Dunbar's number, if you've ever heard of this. 
So Dunbar's number is traditionally as humans, we often lived in tribes. So basically you would live in a village of up to 150 people. And basically as the village or the tribe got bigger than that point, it got to the point where you didn't uh, know everyone in the village and it would start to split off. And this is true with businesses, that if you ever have a business which is more than uh, 150 people, often it's that's the point where you want to go into different divisions and different management structures and that kind of thing. But the reason why this is important is that I, get, I use YouTube every day and I follow probably 200 plus creators, channels, different people on YouTube, stuff that I'm really interested in. So you've got digital photography stuff, you've got video stuff, you've got business stuff. I play basketball, so I follow a lot of basketball stuff. But the one thing that I learned about the internet and the algorithms is that basically, unless you're in someone's top five topics, or of the 300 people that I follow and subscribe to on YouTube, it, it only shows you the algorithm, what you've kind of watched or been interested in in the past like five to 10 days. And the issue is there's lots of brilliant creators out there that might do stuff on photography or cameras or video, which I love that stuff. But because the NBA playoffs are on and I've been watching more NBA stuff, I just wasn't seeing the other content. The reason why I wanted to share this is because I think the roadmap and what we fell into was people still sub still subscribed, but we weren't in anyone's core routine of regular content and useful stuff that people don't search for a lot of the stuff I was making videos on, but also we weren't part of people's routine enough that they would regularly watch the content. So we would just drop out of people's algorithm. And it was because of this, I kind of learned my lesson so that moving forward, for one, I'll be sharing a lot more of the content that we do on the course. But actually on YouTube, people often search for, or TikTok, how to write a business plan, how to manage a team, how to sell to customers, how to do stuff. But people want how-to videos. So my job as a creator now is to create the content people actually look for and try and change to get more into people's routines and regular um, I guess network and yeah, I guess a routine for learning and personal development. And the reason I'm sharing this is just that realistically, I spent three years doing stuff and yes, we got monetized and that kind of thing, but I could have done it better. And I just wanted to share this topic just for anyone that kind of creates stuff that it's just, it's really important to create stuff that people actually want to watch and use. And the truth is, unless people like your comment, uh, like your content or subscribe or whichever, you very quickly fall out the algorithm. It's really hard to get back in. So don't make the mistake I did. One thing that relates to that though, is that it's about a year and a half ago, we got monetized on YouTube. So we had more than the number of followers that you need and the amount of watch hours that I started to get paid off YouTube. And I've been paid a few times based on ad revenue. But I realized that customers hate uh, adverts. So they go and to watch a video and it's just layered with adverts and you can't skip them. And basically the one thing in business is that you never want to uh, basically piss off your customers or do anything which actually people hate or dislike because they'll just leave and go do something else. So one of the good things we actually did do this year was get rid of all of the adverts, which in theory, some people make doesn't make sense to get rid of a revenue stream, but it's in doing it to create content that people actually like more, I think was important. Okay, just out of interest, I know you're hopefully watching this live, but when this goes onto YouTube, I'm gonna remove all the bits of me drinking tea. Just, you get a sore voice doing this thing. It's harder than it looks to stand in a room and speak to a camera on your own, but I do my best, but I do appreciate when people kind of get in touch. The third mistake that I kind of made this year was, so I'm a startup, same as most startups that we have an app we're on Android and iOS. We've got a platform, we've got a service, we've got the different product lines, so we've got the books. And basically like any business, we want to grow and develop. And we have been quite fortunate that we have users in 55 different countries now. But the truth is you kind of want more, you always want more and it's how can you grow a business to actually enable you to do that. So if any of you might know, there's something called Y Combinator. So Y Combinator is the world's biggest startup accelerator. These guys did Dropbox and Airbnb and Coinbase and Stripe and that kind of thing. And basically, if you ever want to create the world's biggest startup, you want to create the next billion dollar startup, Y Combinator is the, the number one place that you want to go. 
So I knew that I was going to apply for the January batch was when it kind of opened. So at the end of last year, I started to ramp up. Okay, what would they want to see? How do we grow? How do we start to implement those things? But in doing so, so we exist for social good. It's a social purpose kind of entity where we want to help empower communities around the world to grow, learn and develop help them build a better life for themselves through access to education, that if they choose to go to a traditional university, brilliant, go and do it, it's fantastic. But the point is, I think there's 5 billion people in the world that can't access and can't afford to do that, and that's why we exist. But in doing so, about looking into venture capital money and what could we do to help grow and scale the business, I think I'd lost some of the magic and the direction of what we were looking to do because Yes, we were never going to lose the free tier and what we were looking to do. But a lot of my focus went into things that investors might want to look at and how do we do AI and lots of different bits. And it was just, I think it was a, a mistake in hindsight, that part of the pivot now that ironically, we could still get interviewed to get into YC. But what's really important is to realize that venture capital money is there as a facilitator to help you accelerate and do more, not necessarily... Well, I guess it depends on the type of business, but just to make money for someone else, does that make sense? And it was almost why I got so excited about trying to build this next billion dollar startup that I started to put in place things and start to really build and scale a team in our marketing and promotion. But arguably, you want to do that after the money lands, not before it does, because essentially I still have to pay for everything. And it was just something that I wanted to share. But actually, the more you understand and have your vision and mission kind of locked down. I just think that's really important to kind of get in. And it was just something I kind of feel that I got wrong this year that I wanted to talk about. So as a management consultant, and because we're bootstrapping, or yeah, I guess we're bootstrapping the business, what that means is that we haven't sought external investment to help us pay for everything. So it means that I have to literally go out, do a job, do multiple jobs, get paid for stuff, which then I come back to pay the rent on this place, uh, buy the cameras, buy all the licenses, do all the software, develop the apps, do that kind of thing. And it's mega, mega crazy expensive. The reason why most people sought, uh, they you know look for external investment right at the start is because what ideally you want to do is be able to focus 100% on the mission to drive forwards as opposed to spend stuff which doesn't help you move forwards. Because of how we bootstrapped, I couldn't do that. I don't regret any of that. But it's that balance of where you then get to a point where you've created a safety net. That it's, I love working with other people. I love working with the teams. I love doing it. But you also have a responsibility to, in the entrepreneurial sense, jump off that cliff and start to throw yourself into the business more, remove the safety net and the parachute just to see what could happen with the business because one of the classic business concepts is that you want to learn and fail fast. And the more you have other revenue streams which aren't directly from the business, you might actually be still going on the wrong path, but you'll never get that course correction until you literally jump off the cliff and then try and figure it out on the way down. This is something that I don't regret that I got wrong. Some people might say that I should have done it sooner, but the important thing is that you recognize this. Uh, for me, it was only recently did I actually pay everything off. So I paid off all of the apps and uh, we have no debt, we have no borrowing. So it's still the right time. I didn't wait two years before making the kind of pivot, but it was just something that I wanted to share that ironically, when you first launch your business, if you do bootstrap and it feels like you're either not making a lot of money, but you're at least working in the business 80% of the time or 100% of the time. That's good because at least you're moving the business forward. As so well, ironically, the, what I was doing was that when I was working a lot for other people, the business was just moving forward, say one day a week as opposed to five days or seven days a week. So I maybe didn't make as much progress as I could have. And it was just a lesson that I wanted to share. It's gonna be different for everyone, but it was just something that I wanted to kind of mention. Um, and then last but not least, one of the things that I think a lot of businesses fall foul of this and kind of get this wrong. So one of the things in the marketing module that we talk about, there's a classic study by two guys called Burnett and Field, and it's to do with, with marketing, you can either generally do what's classed as long-term brand building, which is to do with what people think about the business, what they think about your mission, if they like you or not, and all of the nice stuff that you would normally see. 
And then that's compared with something called short-term sales activation. So that might be, the example I always use is McDonald's. So the long-term brand building is a case of the clever jingles, the, the family time, spending time with friends, uh, that they use sustainable farms and all the nice stuff about McDonald's, that's the brand building. But the short-term sales activation is double cheeseburger 149, they've got a new offer on for this thing, uh, what's the steakhouse stack that's out at the moment. But the idea is you wanna build your brand over time and the, the data says that 60% of your time and marketing spend should be on long-term brand building. So for me, that's what people think about the roadmap, our mission, everything that we want to do. And that hopefully compounds over time to help you grow. But the important thing is actually to then also focus on your short-term sales activation. So what can people buy? How much does it cost? How do they get involved? But there's often an awkwardness involved with sales that I think I'd been guilty of myself, that I wasn't doing it as much as I should have, that yes, I've learned my lesson, and yes, it's not I'm going to start doing more. But the truth is this segment is all about sharing the honest feedback of stuff that I got wrong this year, and I just wanted to kind of share. There are some other things, to be honest, there'll be a hundred things that I kind of got wrong, but these were just five that are things that I kind of came up with, but I'd love if you get involved in the comments or on TikTok if you say hello, just to kind of let me know what you maybe have got wrong in business this year.